Ever since winning the right to host the 2022 World Cup, Qatar has been the source of an almost constant and negative stream of press. From high-level political gas deals and allegations of corruption surrounding the vote back in 2010, to widespread reports of human rights abuses concerning the migrant workforce that is building the stadiums and infrastructure of the tournament. So far, Qatar's Teflon World Cup has managed to survive. But the tournament is still under threat, and not because of any of the things we've mentioned before, at least not directly. Rather, the tournament has become the central pawn in a global political battle between Qatar and its neighbours Saudi Arabia and the UAE. In June 2017, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, where Manchester City's owner Sheikh Mansour is one of the most powerful economic and political figures, were the leading countries in a five-nation coalition that cut all ties with Qatar. All trade was banned, borders were closed, flights between countries stopped, families were separated. Qatar called it a blockade. The move brought temporary chaos to Qatar. Supermarket shelves were emptied and the country's vast reserves were used to counter any damage. The country spent billions of dollars and rerouted supply chains to keep construction on the World Cup going. But what brought Qatar's neighbours to such a drastic course of action? The official explanation was Qatar's alleged support for terrorist movements in the Middle East and its close links to Iran, a Shia theocracy viewed as a historic enemy and an existential threat to Sunni Saudi Arabia in particular. But the truth is much more complex and opaque. It's a story of jealousy and greed of Trump and failed deals, of hacking and propaganda wars, of Al Jazeera and the competing whims and thin skins of a new generation of Arab leaders, of pirated football streams and a trench full of nuclear waste. Well, more on that later. The case against Qatar, that it funds terrorism, is a strange charge to levy, given that Saudi Arabia has been accused of exactly that using its financial clout from owning the world's biggest oil reserves to spread its ultra-conservative form of Islam, Wahhabism, which Qatar also adheres to, far outside of its borders. During the 2016 US presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton criticised Saudi funding for radical schools and mosques around the world that have set too many young people on a path towards terrorism. Back in 2011, Donald Trump agreed, saying that Saudi Arabia was the world's biggest funder of terrorism. Of course, he changed his mind once in office. But Saudi Arabia has taken a new, more muscular path with its foreign policy, under its young crown prince Mohammed bin Salman. Since rising to power, he has shaken up Saudi society, lifting the ban on women driving in the kingdom, as well as the ban on women watching football. On the other hand, he's also cracked down on dissent, locking up dozens of the country's richest men in a five-star hotel until they handed back some of their wealth, as well as locking up dozens of feminist activists who've long campaigned against what's been described as Saudi Arabia's gender apartheid. In the UAE, another crown prince, Mohammed bin Zayed, the brother of Sheikh Mansour, has also been cracking down on dissent. The UAE has virtually no democracy, and some of the harshest social media laws in the world. The country's best-known human rights activist, Ahmed Mansour, was arrested, held incommunicado, and jailed for 10 years for using his social media accounts to publish, quote, false information and spread hatred and sectarianism. The roots of the conflict can be found in the Arab Spring, the series of uprisings across the Middle East that began in Tunisia in 2010 and spread across the region. In Egypt, the long-time dictator Hosni Mubarak was removed from power after hundreds of thousands of people filled Tahrir Square. After Egypt's first free elections, Mohamed Morsi became president, a candidate aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood but who was also a member. The Muslim Brotherhood is a popular political Islamic organisation banned in much of the Middle East as it poses the biggest threat to the Gulf's conservative monarchies. The election of Morsi terrified the Gulf Arab states who feared that they might be next. So much so that when Mohammed bin Zayed met the British Prime Minister David Cameron in 2012, he raised the issue of the UK banning the Brotherhood. If they didn't, British businesses would find difficulty in getting business from the UAE, especially when it came to arms and security contracts. When that didn't work, the UK's ambassador to the UAE was summoned to a meeting with Manchester City chairman Khaldun Al Mubarak, who was also Mohammed bin Zayed's right-hand man and at the heart of the UAE government. The UK will need to consider the political implications when three of its most important allies in the region, meaning Egypt, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, have taken a clear decision regarding the Muslim Brotherhood, The Guardian reported Mubarak as saying. Difficult conversations we've been having will become far more difficult. We are raising a red flag. Qatar, meanwhile, supported the Muslim Brotherhood, and loaned Egypt billions of dollars to help prop up the Morsi government. There was also support for some other Islamic groups in the Middle East, including some that were fighting Bashar al-Assad's government in Syria's civil war, a complicated patchwork of armed groups that were being funded by various outside actors, including the US and the Saudis, sometimes on the same side, sometimes against each other. 
But what has really antagonised Qatar's neighbours over the years is Al Jazeera, the freewheeling state-funded TV network based in Qatar, that aired views from dissidents that openly criticised the policies of Saudi and Emirati leaders, whilst of course refraining to criticise Qatar's own royal family who bankroll it. They accused Qatar of using Al Jazeera to agitate opposition in their own backyards. Now, there had been various fallings out before, including a diplomatic break in 2014, but the election of Donald Trump as US president presented an opportunity. The Saudis and the UAE, who had been supportive of a Trump presidency after becoming enraged with President Barack Obama's softening of ties with Iran and the signing of a deal designed to stop it developing nuclear weapons, convinced him that Qatar was the bad guy. Shortly after the blockade was announced, Trump tweeted, during my recent trip to the Middle East, I stated that there can no longer be funding of radical ideology. Leaders pointed to Qatar. Look. Since then, an information and economic war has been raging, alongside some more petty moves, like the Saudi announcement that it would build a huge trench that would separate Qatar and make it an island. It was announced that Saudi Arabia would fill the trench with nuclear waste. There was the case of Be Out Q, a TV network that emerged overnight and has brazenly been bootlegging Premier League and World Cup football matches in Saudi Arabia. The Middle Eastern rights are held by Be In, a Qatar-owned sports network that was spun off from Al Jazeera. But Qatar's opponents have realised the biggest way to hurt Qatar is to take away its World Cup, in which it has invested huge resources and political capital. When the emails of the UAE's ambassador to the US, Yusuf al Otaiba, a well-connected Sion of Washington's political elite, were leaked, it laid bare a trail of plans aimed at diminishing Qatar's ability to host the World Cup, including one that would force Qatar to share the World Cup with its neighbours. Although apparently unconnected, FIFA president Gianni Infantino has raised the prospect of bringing forward an expanded 48-team World Cup for 2022, such a move would be impossible for Qatar to accommodate, and it would force them to share the finals. It's unclear whether that move will still go ahead, but Saudi Arabia and the UAE may be deepening their ties with FIFA. A new revamped Club World Cup that would challenge the Champions League and bring in a staggering $25 billion was recently proposed and enthusiastically backed by Infantino. It's believed that investors from Japan, the US, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are behind the proposal. There have been several astroturfed human rights groups and Twitter accounts set up to seemingly disparage and amplify Qatar's human rights record. Consultancies and think tanks, the province of their funding unknown, have published critical reports on Qatar's World Cup. Often, their claims have ended up being reported in respected media outlets like the BBC and the Sunday Times. And then there was the recent launch of the Foundation for Sports Integrity, a new anti-corruption organisation at a glitzy event in London full of celebrity speakers. The event focused primarily on Qatar and generated thousands of column inches in the international media criticising Qatar 2022. But the organiser refused to say who was providing the funding for it. Nicholas McGeehan, a worker rights activist who's long been a critic of Qatar's World Cup, was invited to speak. I asked for assurances that it wasn't golf money. It was clear that there was a lot of money behind it, he told The Guardian. Those assurances were given, and then two days later, I was uninvited. They couldn't give a reason as to why I wasn't appearing, it just yells Saudi and UAE money. Qatar has largely managed to weather the storm so far. It has repatriated hundreds of billions of dollars to refill its reserves, and has deepened economic ties with Turkey, Iran and Oman to make up for the loss of trade with its neighbours. The royal family has even managed to win back Trump's affections, a new $1 billion arms deal was announced last year. The country's young emir, Tamin bin Hamad Al Thani, was invited to the White House earlier this year and warmly welcomed by Trump. But that is unlikely to be the end of it. In a few months' time, qualification for Qatar 2022 is slated to begin. A decision on the 48-team World Cup will have to be made before then. Qatar's World Cup has had plenty of legitimate criticism when it comes to human rights and worker abuses, but there is also a bigger game at play, involving two countries whose human rights records are perhaps even worse. The only thing we know for sure is that the bad news stories on Qatar 2022 will continue. The question is, where are they really coming from?